I guess Anjana is not here, right? No. Madam, your name? Amruta, you are uh, chairperson in the other session, right? Fine, you can present first, no problem. Amruta Vijay More will be presenting on the topic Tips and Tricks of Dealing with Vasculitic Tractional Retinal Detachment. Present a uh, video, please. Today we are going to deal with a 37-year-old male patient who was facing the Griesen disease for two months in both the eyes. So let's start with the case. We are dealing with uh, vasculitic tractional retinal detachment. So starting off with uh, four vitrectomy in this eye, you can see that we are debulking the vitre. So that you can see posteriorly. Here you can see there's a lot of heme. You can, after clearing, you can see that there is a traction which is noticed from the disc towards the anterior side of the retina. You can see that you're getting in through this part this of the midvitreous cavity. The midvitreous cavity is the area where you may get an opening post the posterior hyaloid phase. So now we stop and we take a look at this area. We zoom in, we see that there is this area where you can go in. So now we realize that we're not really sure that we can go in from the peripheral part uh, of the retina. So we try in for the inside out technique. Now we can see that we can use our vitric test to cut through and to segment this area to create different islands to release the traction. After cutting, the arrow points towards two flaps those are created. Now these two flaps will be in posterior in utilization for sealing this vitric of the retinal surface. We are creating an inferior island by using the vitrector and sealing this area of the retinal surface. You can see that we have slowly and gradually lifted off the traction which is now released. You can see this in slow motion and in zoom view that slowly we are lifting off the vitric of the retinal surface. This is now cut and now a posterior island of this fractional area, the epicenter is created. We have now cut this area. You can see that the vitric is slowly being cut. The vitric nowadays or 25 days can be used in multiple ways. It can be used to peel, to cut, to get into areas which are smaller owing to its small diameter. You can now see that this island has been created and by placing the vitrector under it, we have remove the whole area of the epicenter. Going on to the next areas, now we are peeling the vitric off the surface to reach towards the periphery. Now this has to be done very slowly so as to avoid undue traction to areas which may create breaks. So now again debulking, debulking over the surface so as to see posteriorly what is being cut or pulled we go in again to the same area and we try to delaminate this area. Now what we are doing is outside in we are just peeling off this area. We can also see that there are active patches of choroiditis in this area. This whole area now being peeled off, we can easily cut it off with the cutter and you can see that uh, posteriorly on the retina there is a lot of active vasculitis which can be noticed in this area. Now this case was also done post antivagus. Antivagus was injected five days prior in this patient. Here this is a small island which is left. No actual good plane can be found out in this area. What we can see is now the arrow points towards a shining membrane which is the second membrane and which cannot be peeled off or our vitrector cannot get in uh, into a good plane by which we can remove this. So what we do is now next we use an ILM forceps and you can uh, we can see the release of this membrane and after peeling of this membrane we have now secured a good plane and this island has now been cut with the vitrector. Now you can see that the epicenter is gone but there are bleeders. These bleeders now have to be cauterized in order to avoid loose blood in the post-op period. Looking for bleeders elsewhere, you can decrease the pressure also to zero and see if there are any oozers present. Now, since we cannot find any bleeders or oozers, a tricot wash at the end of the case is essential to see if there's any posterior cortical vitreous remnants to avoid any traction in the post-operative period. Here, a post tricot wash in the inferior area where the traction retinal detachment was present, we noticed that there's a little amount of fibrin admixed with a little amount of posterior cortical vitreous, which can be easily pulled off 
with the help of your restrictor. Okay. We can now see that the restrictor has removed all of these actions by massaging the retina gently. You can also notice that uh, there was a bleeding spot right in this area. The whole of the vitreous is now removed. ILM feeling is, was essential in this case because there was an area where there was traction and that area was causing ILM fold. Since ILM fold will feel as if the retina was a little pulled in the direction of the traction, that is why ILM feeling would release a little amount of traction on the fovea which may cause metamorphopsia in the postoperative period. So ILM peeling just enough to release the traction was important. A good base resection is important because it will help us avoid any post-operative leaching of blood into the vitreous cavity. Fluid air exchange was performed in this surgery so as to uh, let the loose blood in the anterior area to drain down to the posterior vitreous cavity and to be sucked into the vitreous cell. A complete fluid air exchange was performed and laser was done. Now laser is done from aura to aura, so in the areas of uh, ischemia. Also, we have to take care that this is avoiding the tractional retinal detachment area. Good laser is essential in these cases. To conclude, Pan-retinal photocoagulation was done in this case, avoiding the uh, tractional retinal detachment. The whole of the area was then checked if it was completely laser. This case was closed under facts and uh, the port was, port was sutured with 6O vitreous. The post-operative image of this patient has been displayed and this patient had a vision of 618 at the end of 3 weeks. Nice presentation. Okay. Any uh, chances of recurrence in these cases? Sir, uh, recurrence of uh, bleeding, you're saying? Uh, bleeding. Yes, uh, sir, uh, this case I've observed for six uh, months now, mm. and uh, the patient did not have uh, loose blood in the post op period. Okay. Now, loose blood can occur if there is uh, a new vascularization frond which we have left, or uh, not, uh, or the patient has high blood pressure, or he has coughing bouts, or any such things. But presently, uh, the patient was a young patient, mm -hmm. about 40 years, uh, 35, 40 years old, mm -hmm. and uh, this was a vasculitic case. Also, secondarily, uh, the other eye got secondarily involved in this patient. Okay. So he had come with 6 weeks, and then later on, he had these huge neovascular fronds. He had a montu of around 25, necrotic montu, and uh, that is how then again we went on with the treatment of uveitis mm -hmm. and this going sideways. The other eye was treated with uh, lasers, but uh, he did not uh, respond very well. So again, he underwent a surgery in the second eye as well. Okay. Now, this video I basically put up uh, for uh, since it's study, like uh, to teach as a oh, teaching so video, which was one of the part of this uh, okay. surgery. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Rajiv Gandhi, sir. demonstrates various cases of vitreous hemorrhage. First case is of a fresh diabetic vitreous hemorrhage with posterior vitreous detachment. As posterior vitreous detachment is present, as soon as the vitreous tunnel is darkened and you find the flame, you can see a gush of blood coming and the vitreous hemorrhage clearing. cases have a good post-op outcome usually as the vitreous hemorrhage is fresh and the PVT is present. The next case is of a cold white vitreous hemorrhage with posterior vitreous detachment. The vitreous is white in color as the hemorrhage is long standing. A pre-operative ultrasound can give you an idea about PVD presence and if there is PVD is present even though the vitreous hemorrhage is long standing these cases usually have a good surgical outcome.
next stage is of a sticky grey vitreous hemorrhage which is a combination of old and new hemorrhage with no PVD. These cases are usually difficult as there is no posterior vitreous detachment and the vitreous is very sticky. Once you start vitrectomy with the cutter and the vitreous is thick and sticky due to the thickness of the vitreous the cutters might get blocked and as the vitreous is very sticky there are chances you might end up creating iatrogenic breaks or any intraocular other complications these cases you have to be careful when you are close to the retina Next case is of a clear vitreous with no posterior vitreous detachment and the vitreous is plastered to the retina. These are the cases where staining is useful for identifying the vitreous and inducing PVD. As vitreous is adherent to the retina and no PVD is present. Normal PVD induction with the cutter may not, might not be possible and accessory instruments like soft tip or a pick or forceps might be useful in inducing PVD in such cases. Also these are the cases where there are higher chances of creating an iatrogenic break during PVD induction are more. Last case is of a vitreous hemorrhage with PVD seen on ultrasound preoperatively but turns out to be a vitreoshysis intraoperatively. These cases you have to be careful as they appear deceptive as there is no PVD present but only vitreosis is seen. These cases you also encounter a lot of membranes which are seen adhered to the retina, retinal surface. You have to be careful in removing the membranes along with the DVD. So to conclude, Although vitreous hemorrhage cases are considered fairly easy, vitreous can show different shades and proper preoperative and intraoperative evaluation is important for a good surgical outcome. Thank you. So basically, uh, this is like the presentation of was of my brother. He is he has not come actually. He he left early yesterday. So I'm an anterior segment surgeon. So I'm I'm presenting on his behalf. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Good. Good morning, everyone. Thirty-nine-year-old female uh, presented to us with decreased vision in the left eye since last one and a half year. On examination, her best corrected visual equity in left eye was six by sixty, and on fundus examination, diagnosis of optic disc split with SRF at macula was made. We did a three-port sparsplenar vitrectomy along with ILM peeling. Approx three disc diameter of ILM was seen. Keeping the temporal disc attachment of ILM flap intact.
the free ilum from temporal side of the macula was stuffed in the optic disc pit covered by the ilum flap and then pspl was put fluid air exchange was done followed by substitution of air with 16% sf6 gas post op bcva after 6 weeks was 6 by 24 with significant reduction in subretinal fluid and patient was fairly happy everyone today i'll be taking you through a case where i was going to make it simple but complications fell through a 41 year old male from vijayanagaram andhra pradesh presented with chief complaints of right eye blurring of vision since 5 months he was a known diabetic with uncontrolled blood sugar his visual acuity in right eye was 2800 and in right eye posterior segments there was presence of cystic hemorrhage broad fibrovascular proliferation over macula small break in suprotemporal quadrant and surrounding subretinal fluid and subretinal hemorrhage suggestive of right eye combined retinal detachment and he was planned for right eye pass plana vitrectomy with membrane peeling endolaser and silicone oil injection under local anesthesia but the preoperative risk factors before going ahead was uncontrolled blood sugar and uncontrolled renal parameter So the sclerotomy ports were made 3.5 mm away from the limbus, followed by which anterior vitrectomy and core vitrectomy was done. Truncation of the cone was done in all the quadrants to separate anterior vitreae from the posterior vitreous. vitrectomy was done over the fibrous proliferation to separate vitreous fraction overhead membranes were dissected after identifying the correct plane of dissection segmentation and delamination was done the preretinal membranes were further removed with forceps along with superior and inferior vascular arches and trimmed with cutters Iatrogenic breaks were noted at the edges of the membranes, which were diathelioids, along with the primary break. After this, ILM was fused with ILM peeling forceps after staining with brilliant blue dye. Large subretinal blood clots were aspirated from site of break, which was converted into retinotomy for efficient clot removal. laser was done around the breaks 
followed by pan retinal photocoagulation. Silicon oil injection of 1000 centrosomes per ton, pores per dent plate, followed by povidone iodine wash. On post-operative day 1, retina was on under eyes, 1560 degree laser mark. His visual acuity after 6 months was 20 by 100 after silicone oil removal attached to retina. So the complexities in this case were extensive dense pre-retinal traction in a background of atrophic thin retina due to chronic ischemia and identification of correct plane of dissection of membrane and their removal to open the macular fold. ILM peeling in background of chronically folded macula, the peeling was necessary for complete removal of hyaloids and prevention of macular pucker in the future and subretinal blood clot removal, otherwise it would have led to subretinal fibrosis and poor visual recovery. Thank you.